Okay, thank you for coming tonight for the Engineering Week 1978 keynote address. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Stephen Henry Schneider. He currently lives in Boulder, Colorado. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in 1966 from Columbia University, he received his master's in 1967 from the same institution, and he received his doctorates in 1971 from Columbia University. He is currently the scientist and deputy head of the Climate Project for the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. He has many publications and is active in numerous national organizations and advisory boards. His current book, The Genesis Strategy, Climate and Global Su Survival, is selling well. His talk tonight is on climate, food production, and energy in the future. Dr. Schneider. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to find out your book is selling well. <laughs> Now I have to call the publisher and find out. <laughs> uh, actually, I, uh, it's my second visit to Iowa State, except this time I had a, uh, an experience with one of the distinguished Iowa citizens. At uh, noon today, I met Floppy the Puppet. <laughs> and uh, I understand that that was the way that, uh, to get the best way to get engineers to come to a talk is to promote it on Floppy. That's what I was told. <laughs> Anyhow, tonight, We'll talk about a number of things, and some of it will have to do with engineering. I'm a climatologist. That's somebody who studies the climate. So uh, obviously, I will be unable to avoid talking about that. But uh, we also want to talk to you about some things we've learned about the climate from engineering type work, and some things we've learned about the climate which relates to engineering, namely how to produce food, and it's the amount of energy one needs, and then finally we'll come back to what I think is the most interesting and important question. Sometimes the byproducts of engineering are not always good, and uh, pollution being the obvious example, and we'll ask the question later at the end, does the quality of life that we've improved through our engineering continue to improve to all levels of engineering, or are there some stages when the byproducts of what we do raise questions about that very quality of life. And how that ties back to climate, you'll see, because some of the pollutants that we put in the air now are more than just an argument between an environmentalist and an industrialist, but actually could affect climate, as you'll see. And people in this part of the world know certainly how important weather and climate can be. Now, I mostly have uh, slides to show you to try to uh, keep focused. You don't see any notes, and that's not because I have memorized the talk or providing a complete act, but because the slides serve as them for me and hopefully will give you something to remember other than just seeing this uh, talking face at the front of the room. So if we can have the lights down and the projector up, we can start. I understand there's a question and answer period afterward, but uh, if anybody has an absolutely burning uh, informational type question during the presentation, feel free to chime in, but if we have too much discussion during it, we'll never get to the question and answer. Okay. Now, one of the first things you learn about in engineering is signal-to-noise problem, and at the moment, the light noise is larger than the light signal. So if we can get the lights in the front out, that would help. Does anybody know how to do that? Okay. It looks like we need more than that. Well, in any case, the first slide is not... Uh, oh, it, there's a very good example of cutting back noise. The first slide is one that I took actually in Berkeley, not far from the university, uh, last year when I was there. And it's a picture actually of a carousel, as you can see down toward the bottom. Uh, and it's not that I'm here only to show you a carousel, even though some of this talk will appear to some of you to be a bit of a whirlwind. But it's because of the sign I saw above it. And it just says, as you can see, open Saturday and Sunday, 10 AM, weather permitting. And that's something that many of us take for granted, weather permitting. Uh, we live in houses, and we don't particularly worry about what the temperature is outside. The thermostat works on it automatically. And the only way we find out if it's been a cold winter is in our heating bill. But in this region in particular, where farming is a major industry, we know that weather permitting is a very serious and important consequence. And it's not just farming. It also affects water supply. It affects health. 
and it affects other factors too. Uh, for example, in the east this year, there was a fair amount of snow. And I remember I was back east and was being asked by a number of reporters uh, if the ice age was coming in view of their major snowstorms. In fact, in the next slide, which I took in New York in February this past year, uh, you can see they had a fair degree of snow there. Now, is it so unusual to get two 20-inch snowstorms in the winter? Uh, does it mean the ice age is coming? And uh, I remember discussing this. In fact, I think it was with a television news reporter. And he said, but we've never had traffic jams like this. And I asked him, I said, well, imagine a nice, beautiful spring day. There are no accidents on the highways. The sun is shining. No one is complaining. Are the roads free? I mean, they're completely jammed up under the best of times. Now you get a snowstorm. It takes away two out of three lanes. And you have not an ice age, but you have the problem with what's called carrying capacity. You've exceeded the ability of the system to absorb that kind of snowstorm. We don't have any, what we'd call, in engineering sense, resilience in the system. And in a way, it's the same thing in New York. It wasn't a 40-inch snow. That's just what the snow plow piled up, because when it went down the street, it filled up along the sides, and the cars got buried. Well, so the cars got buried. That wasn't so serious. The next picture shows you something a little more serious. It took a month and a half before the garbage could get collected because all the snow plows were out piling up, driving down the street in order to pile up snow on top of the parked cars. So the ones that weren't parked could go down the street. And the question, though, is really a very significant one that comes out from this kind of a picture. Now, I could show you pictures of buffalo and other things, but the real point is, is a simple one. It's not just the weather that affects us, although the weather certainly affects us. But it's also true that how we're prepared to deal with the extremes of the weather is going to tell us as much about how severely we'll be impacted as how severe a weather extreme will be. If you have a drought and you've got good irrigation water, clearly you're not going to be hurt as badly as if you don't. Or if you have high winds and you don't have every acre plowed, you'll lose less soil than if you do. So again, every time we talk later on about engineering to, to protect ourselves, you have to recognize that when nature gives us extremes, how it hits us depends upon how we're prepared. In fact, and one can never resist a book plug, the Genesis strategy means simply that, building hedges into your system, being prepared to absorb extremes, and it's not a brilliant new idea. It's, I think, a brilliant old one from Joseph in Egypt, who in the book of Genesis, of course, warned the pharaoh of the seven lean years to follow the seven fat ones, and his strategy then was a food reserve. And while that's a fair amount about what I talk about today with modern technology and modern engineering devices, it's not just food that we're talking about, but also water and energy reserves and trade and, and a lot of factors. And basically, it raises the question again, What's the appropriate amount of technology and management that we need to deal with environmental variability? Well, in New York, that particular snowstorm, I think the most appropriate technology is on the next slide. I remember this. And they were getting around with the least amount of trouble. And uh, even though these were children playing, I recall being in, um, in near Vienna this past winter and literally people dragged their groceries behind them on sleds. That was a very appropriate technology for that kind of climate. So now, appropriateness again depends upon where you are and what kind of extreme you're trying to deal with. Okay, if we can move on with the slides, we'll get back. I mentioned the word ice age, so I first thought it might be appropriate just to show some of you what an ice age really looked like. There, on this picture, this shows the maximum extent of ice in the northern hemisphere during the recent glacial ages. Now, a glacial age means that there's a lot of ice on Earth. We've come to refer to an ice age not as the absence or presence of ice, but an ice age is when the ice is in extreme value, even in between the ice ages, and that's what we call interglacials or climatic optimum periods. Uh, there's still ice. It still sits on the Greenland continent and on the uh, Antarctic continent, and we don't see it here, is always sea ice. That means the ocean that covers the North Pole and much of it down into the North Atlantic uh, is covered with sea ice and frequently with icebergs which fall off the Greenland continent, uh, made famous since the Titanic. But they're there, and in the winter, in the Northern Hemisphere, they cover about 5% of the 
of the surface of the Earth. That's a fairly extensive coverage. In the summer, they melt back to about, oh, two or three percent. And as a result of that ice, we've got it, it floats and comes and goes, and then the land ice sits. Now, if the ice that's floating on that ocean melts, it isn't going to raise the sea level any more than if an ice cube in your martini, if you like that analogy, melts, it isn't going to make it pour over the side, simply because that ice cube or that floating ice has already displaced its weight in water and already caused the sea level to rise. But if there's ice on the continents, as you can see where it says continental ice sheets, those big blocks of ice contain water. They're f not floating on the water. They're not floating in the ocean, rather. They're sitting on the land. So therefore, the volume of water involved in the ice on the continents is not displacing its weight in the oceans. So if it melts, it raises the sea level. And conversely, if it builds up, as in an ice age where you can see the glaciers come all the way down right around to uh, Wisconsin and almost where Iowa is, uh, then the opposite happens. The sea levels are very low. So in an ice age, and the last one, most severe one, recent one that is, occurred about 17, 18,000 years ago. It had its maximum and it disappeared more or less about 10,000 years ago. The sea level was tens of meters lower than it is today. And there was a time when the sea level was maybe five meters higher uh, than it was today when the maximum amount of melting took place. If all the water that's stored on the South Polar ice cap and on the Greenland ice cap melted, it could raise the sea level, oh, I think the number is something like 60 or 70 meters, nearly 200 feet. And uh, that would certainly uh, have implications of interest to people living on coasts. We'll talk later about whether that's a possibility and which direction we're going in. And let's go on to the next slide. Uh, now you can see pictures of temperatures. And these are called generalized trends in global climate. And that's something you say when you're not quite sure what you've got. You say generalized. And what we have here are some estimates of what the temperature was like on a bunch of scales. Let's start with a lower Let's see, right-hand side. Lower right-hand side shows the last 100,000 years, okay? Each one of those little divisions is 25,000 years. About 125,000 years ago, you see there was a very warm period, and then there's lots of oscillations, warmings and coolings, on a slow and gradual slide toward what we call an ice age. Then the height of the ice age, that means it's coldest, around 20,000 years ago, and then a quick recovery, in fact, a dramatic recovery, as you can see, where the warmest time occurred something like about 8,000 years ago. If you go to the panel that's next over to the left, you see 30,000 years, and there's this warm period about five to 10,000 years ago. We call that the climatic optimum. Well, in fact, people believe that civilization began to take form during that time, particularly in the Middle East and in, and in Africa. And we know that at that time it was wetter in the, in the desert regions when it was warmer, and probably drier right here. And it's a rather interesting archaeological fact that uh, five to 10,000 years ago, during this warm period, the Earth was maybe, as you can see from the graph, just a one, maybe two degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. And that caused considerably longer growing seasons in the very high latitudes. Uh, it caused wetter uh, conditions in the very high latitudes. That means something like central Canada or northern Russia. It caused wetter uh, desert regions. The, the Sahara was clearly not the desert it is today. The reliability of rainfall in the Indian monsoon regions where the seasonal rains there are so important to their, their lives and their food production was better. But ironically, while it was better on either side of us, the central part of the U.S. then was very dry. In fact, what the archaeologists called the Prairie Peninsula extended out into the, uh, the eastern reaches of the Corn Belt into Ohio. So if you're trying to decide if you like warming or cooling better, if you want to use the analogy of five to 10,000 years ago, from our point of view, food growing would be more difficult in the warming, simply because it seems for our particular area that it was drier and warmer. If you lived in India, you'd probably be better off, or in northern Canada, you'd be better off. 
And that's a message that will come through every time we talk about climate, and you'll see why later. Some people are better off, some people are worse off. Clearly, if the glaciers grew to the extent that they did in that extreme, I can't imagine us being better off having half of the continent covered with ice. But small warmings and small coolings, it's not clear who wins and who loses. It's only clear that things redistribute. Now let's look at the, the last thousand years, this panel in the upper right. We can see a warm period from around the year 900 AD to about 1400 AD. That's a period which was called the medieval optimum in the terms of the geographers. And in Eastern Europe, that record exists. And by the way, some of you may be wondering, how do we know what was going on in Eastern Europe from 900 to 1400? Let alone, how do we know there were interglacial and glacial periods coming and going every few tens of thousand years when nobody was there as far as we know, at least unless von Donneken was right, uh, telling us what the temperature was, measuring it and writing it down? Well, we know, sort of, that's why they say generalized, we know by going back and looking at the kinds of plants that grew there, the pollen that you take out of a out of the sediment of a lake or out of a soil tells you whether the plants were warm loving or cold loving. We know by doing things as strange as dropping big cores, big metal pistons into the oceans, which then take up a long tube of mud, and then looking in the mud and then counting a very tedious procedure under a microscope, very microscopic uh, little plants and animals. And there are literally hundreds of species and some of them like warm and some of them like cold. You can figure out if the water surface was warm and cold. And there are other things that people do. People look at the, the dates at which uh, cherry blossoms and peach blossoms bloom. And the Japanese is a good example. If you look at the dates of uh, bloom of, of the cherry blossoms of the Empress cherry blossoms in Tokyo, you can find that the more severe winters, they usually bloom a little later. Uh, and that record extends back in Kyoto for centuries. In fact, some people have even looked at the bloom dates and tried to correlate them to sunspots and done other things. But when you do that, you sometimes have some trouble because when I checked into it, I found out that uh, the date records that go back in the emperor's uh, cherry blossoms are not necessarily the uh, dates the cherry blossoms bloom, but they were the dates that the emperor went to see them. Now, if that correlates with sunspots, perhaps. So we have a problem. We don't have measurements directly. We have to use proxy records. And we do need to know what the climate used to be like in order to guess not only what it might be in the future, but to figure out what humans might be doing to it. And that's the bottom line of where we're getting to. Uh, how is our engineering beginning to affect the climate? And if it is, can we engineer our way out of it? And that's, as I said earlier, is the question we'll be aiming at. So we have a hint about how the patterns have evolved. And now we have to try to be more specific. Well, to be more specific, we go to the last panel and that's the one in the upper left. And that's the air temperature measured over the last 100 years in the thermometers of the world, at least in this case, the Northern Hemisphere. And you see a warming trend from about 1880 to about 1950, and then a cooling trend to about the middle of the 1960s. What's been happening in the last, oh, 20 or so years, at least 10 years, is not as clear. Uh, in fact, I was thinking I might ask you, how many people here think that right now the global climate is warming? No hands. How many think it's cooling? It always works that way. I think that uh, about three-fourths of the people think that it's uh, cooling. I think that's essentially roughly proportional to the size of the headlines each condition gets. The real answer is that we don't know which it's doing. And the reason we don't know which it's doing in the last five to ten years is, is literally billions and billions of bits of information. Measurements from thermometers all over the world, from satellites, uh, from airplanes and ships. And it takes something like five to ten years before all that information is assembled, put on computer tape, averaged out to tell us if it's warming or cooling. The best we can do is take a look at a few hundred records isolated around the Earth, some of them in the oceans, two and three thermometers representing a whole ocean. And uh, that's a very dangerous way to guess trends. And when we do that, it suggests, by the way, that that cooling trend bottomed out around 1968 to 1972, depending upon what part of the Northern Hemisphere you were in, and it started back up 
But we really can't be too sure, and we can't be too sure for the reason I said. But also notice the magnitude of that cooling is about two or three tenths of a degree. And from 1400 to about 1800, as you can see in the upper right panel, there was about a degree and a half cooling, this period known as a little ice age in Europe. So that even if it's still cooling, we're still not a very severe event relative to what we've had in the last few hundred years. And in any case, very typical of the sorts of fluctuations in climate you always get. Later on, it's against this fluctuating background, this signal to noise problem, as communications engineers know, that we'll have to judge what humans are doing. One more point. Notice that the graph is plotted on the upper left as a delta T, and most of you are in engineering or related to it, know that delta means a change. So it's a change in temperature. So there is something like six tenths of a degree warming over the last, well, from the 1950s, say, to 1880. And first of all, that doesn't seem like very much, and we'll see in a minute that that can be important. But first, why did they plot it as delta T? Why didn't they plot it as temperature, the absolute temperature of the hemisphere? It's a funny reason for that, and it's not usually widely known. I'm sure you've, if you've probably seen that picture before, even though you haven't noticed it. It's been in a lot of newspaper and magazine articles. Because it really isn't the temperature of the Northern Hemisphere. It's the temperature of the thermometers in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you plotted up those numbers, the way it's graphed by, originally by Murray Mitchell, who did it, you'd find out that it comes out between 9 and 10 degrees Celsius. And I should be able to convert that to Fahrenheit, 50, something like that. The mean temperature of the planet, on the other hand, is not 9 to 10, but about 15 degrees Celsius, 57 degrees F. What's the difference? The difference is that most of the thermometers exist in our latitudes, in the technologically advanced countries in the Northern Hemisphere, and that vast areas of Pacific Ocean and the tropics are uncovered, so therefore, it's not really a measure of the absolute temperature. However, the trends are probably fairly close to accurate because it's unlikely that the trends in climate would accidentally fall in between where our thermometers are. But the reason for giving you all this detail is to point out just how difficult it is to tell you even what the now cast is, that is, what the global climate is like. And when we try to predict the future, we have an even greater degree of uncertainty. Fortunately, in the last Ten years, we've had two very major technological inventions, or at least they, they were invented long before that, but which have come into the fore in the last ten years, namely computers and satellites, both of which give us a, a better than bird's eye view of the planet and the energy that comes in and out and a way to measure its temperature. And also, we have the computers to store the data. Okay. Well, I mentioned Little Ice Age. This is an interesting thing. This is a very pre-computer. It's one way we also reconstruct the climate. We look at history and art. And here's a, uh, a color print called Frozen Thames from 1684 during the Little Ice Age when the Thames was frozen about 10 times more frequently than it had been in the previous few decades, and in fact, than it has been in the next few. The problem is you can't really compare it because in the next few decades, it's not just the temperature that tells you whether the Thames freezes, but the stream flow and since there are locks and dams upstream, that changes the stream flow. And since there are power plants dumping heat, thermal pollution into the waters, we can't use a comparison. But it, it certainly does tell us that the Little Ice Age was a cold period relative to what it was before that. And there are other indicators too, as we'll see. OK, this is a very interesting slide. There'll be two of them, and we'll hold the second one in, for a minute until we can point out some features on this one. This is a photograph taken in 1966 in the French town of Argentière. It's the Argentière Glacier up in the top. You can see the glacier, oh, about two church steeples worth above it. And uh, it's a measure of, of the climate. And uh, it's interesting to note that about 100 years ago, the global, or at least hemispheric temperature, despite all the, the problems I told you in estimating, it was something like one degree Celsius cooler, a seemingly small number. But it's interesting to see that seemingly small numbers for long-term climates can have very important local consequences, especially in a marginal area like this. And if you look at that church steeple, look at the glacier, I'll show you not a photograph, 
but an etching made 100 years earlier of the same scene when the temperature was maybe a degree cooler on the hemispheric basis. And we can see that next. See how the ice here just comes right down to the plane of the town. And in fact, they probably put the town there. I also always notice, I never can help noticing whenever I see this picture, that the town also looks the same today as it did 100 years ago, and as if somehow uh, they forgot about modernity. I wonder if, say, the building right in front of the church, we should knock it down and put in a target. Well, certainly, I'm not trying to say that if we cooled one degree, that ice would once again be marching back down Wisconsin and coming down into Chicago and curing the problems of revenue sharing. It takes, as you've heard, thousands of years before an ice age builds up, and an ice age is maybe five degrees Celsius colder than today. But the point that really comes through is that in areas, especially a marginal area, and a marginal area means that a small change in the average conditions leads to a large response. If you're in a dry area, a small increase in drying can eliminate the ability to grow a crop. If you live in an area which has a marginal growing season length, a small shortening can eliminate the ability to grow that crop. Well, if you live in a mountain town or at the northern end, a small change in temperature can mean a growth in a glacier. And we'll find that when the climate changes, I said some people are better off and some are worse off. But the people who change most are the people who are at the margins, the people who are at the extreme edge, for example, at the southern end of the Corn Belt would be the ones who'd be hurt most by a warming as the rain belt would move northward. Or people at the northern end would be hurt most by a cooling because a slight shortening in the growing season would make their climate not seem slightly different, but radically different from the activities they were trying to pursue. And that message really is the main one that comes from this graph. Well, let's go and take a look now at some questions about uh, food. I said that would be part of it. And this is a graph which uh, I took from uh, Dean Louis Thompson right here in Iowa State. And uh, I took it from him about five, four to five years ago because you see it says solar cycle and drought in Nebraska. And you see about every other solar cycle there's been a drought. And since it was 1973 when I took this graph, there was a question mark. And uh, there are some dots, the sunspots uh, have gone back to uh, not only to that line, but back up again. And there was some severe, although fairly short, periods of drought in this region. And there was some longer and more severe drought to the west, especially to the west of the continental divide in this period. Nobody knows why. Uh, nobody really understands the connection between sunspots and drought. And there's even a question as to whether it's an accident. One of my favorite uh, studies that's been done here was you know, published in 1937 in a book called Sunspots and Its Effects by a man named Harold True Stetson. And the next slide shows you the quality of some of the work that's been done in sunspots. And uh, this is a correlation, if you can just focus the top, between the sunspot number and, and the Dow Jones stock market average. And then the uh, sunspot number and the wine vintages. Apparently it says 29 was a very good year for wine. However, uh, this has not been a good enough year for book sales for me to be able to afford any 29. Automobiles. Now, are these accidents or are they related? I mean, how does one know? Well, in fact, the next slide, my favorite one, is right there. That's the one on the, the right-hand side, which is the correlation between the sunspot numbers and the bunny rabbit population in central England. <laughs> now, what people say about bunnies, one could say about some of this. But the fact is, we don't really know the extent to which this is nonsense. Unfortunately, it's given the field a bad name. And uh, the real problem is, if you try to correlate something that changes, especially something on the sun, and we'll see in a few minutes that the sun is what drives our climate, if you try to correlate that to something on Earth, you're bound to find some correlations. If I take a coin out of my pop pocket and I flip it a hundred times, sometime in that hundred I'm, I've got a fair chance of getting uh, five or eight heads in a row as we had five 22-year droughts. Now the question is, is it a loaded coin or are we just lucky? Again, the question is, have we had these droughts or are we lucky? And I think by lucky I mean is it just a, uh, an accident? Is it a statistical quirk? 
And the answer still remains unknown, although I think the evidence is fairly strong that, that there's a connection, but we still have no idea why. And again, if you're getting an impression of a lot of uncertainty, I want you to have that impression, because it's against that background that we begin to see that humans are now getting into the system. But first, a little bit more about food. Oh, yeah, part of growing food is having water. And I went up hiking last year in September to nearby mountains, uh, about 30 minutes drive from where I live in Boulder, and hiked up to uh, Lake Isabel with my fishing rod, planning to have trout for dinner. And that's what I found. And uh, as many of you know, we had had two years of severe drought in the Rocky Mountains. And if we had had a third one, uh, we would have been virtually out of water in, uh, in Denver and many other areas. And already agricultural uh, use of water was severely cut back. Fortunately, we had a good snowpack last year, but we've had a very dry, hot summer, and it's, the reservoirs are back down again, and we have to hope for another good year. And that brings up questions of food. Now, here's some graphs which are old, and they're deliberately old. These show changing pattern of world grain trade. And part of engineering is economics, too. And part of economics is trade. And I show them up to 1973. And later on, I'm going to show you the more recent results. Because there's a story involved. The last time I was here, in fact, I think I used this very slide and was arguing for what I then call the Genesis strategy. And in the last three or four years, several things have happened. And let's trace the history of this argument. In fact. Dean Thompson was right in the middle of it, having had many, many communications. I have a whole chapter in here with the then Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, and others, urging uh, that one consider the dangers of, of, uh, of bad weather years on changing the yields of, especially, corn and wheat and soybeans. 